Hi everyone, sorry I'm a bit late today. I had everything set up last night and then um, underestimated how long it takes in the morning. Let me just pull up the chat on my phone so I can follow along. How's everyone doing today? I know everybody's been live streaming this week and I thought I'd join in on the action. But I wanted to keep this keep this uh, politics free and just just a kind of a hangout chat and we'll be talking about books I have a list of things that I've read recently and uh, some plans for the rest of this year's reading so I'll be sharing all that and let me know what you're reading if you've come across any good uh, any good books or movies or anything you'd like to share also, please remember to like the video. That helps me out uh, channel-wise. I'm really grateful for all the people who subscribed recently um, in spite of my two-week break. So really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I hope to get back into making videos again. I've been busy with just life stuff and trying to um, hit the reset on on some, some things as I start a new job potentially and you know, just just all that stuff so yeah let's um let me see if i can get my windows situated here so i'll start by talking about what i've been reading since my last videos and for those of you who follow the blog um, this won't necessarily be new but I might share some new information about what I thought of these books. All right, so um, let me just go over to my blog actually. And I have, um, let's see, a few smallish books that I've been reading or have read recently. And uh, this actually isn't the complete list. So let me just switch back for a minute. So. Uh, what I'll start with talking about is this book called Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. I saw this book, I think it was on Instagram, and um, this author Yu, his book has been, I think, shortlisted, I want to say. Um, some, something to do with the National Booker Prize, which I really don't know that much about, honestly, so... This isn't by any means, uh, like, I, I don't really know enough about the price to tell you more, I, but I thought the book sounded interesting. It's about this actor who is a Chinese American and he wants to make it big in Hollywood. And uh, as it turns out, he just finds himself getting lumped into stereotypes and really not being able to land a major role. Uh, the, bo the book is kind of creative though. It's told in the form of a TV script and the plot kind of switches back and forth between, uh, between real life and fictional life. So as he's um, auditioning or acting actually in this TV series, um, there's also these other roles that he's playing in his life and he's seeing his parents play. And so it kind of studies um, different stereotypes that Asian Americans have fallen into. It talks about some of the history of these immigrants. And I don't know, it was a very funny book. So even though the subject matter is kind of heavy, it's pretty funny. Um, it does get a little heavier towards the ending, which I think might have been unnecessary. Overall, really enjoyed this book, would recommend it. And, you know, even if uh, books about race relations aren't really something you read much, it's not really something I read much. I just thought this was very, very cleverly written and the humor really makes it accessible. So, um, yeah, that's into interior Chinatown, excuse me. <clears throat> Only thing about filming in the morning is my voice is kind of, <laughs> kind of not there yet. I had to get my my tea, of course. All right. So what else? 
going back to my blog post that I did, um, I'll just go through these and there's a few that I might actually be able to give a little more detail on than I did in the blog post. So um, this past month or October, I should say, I just kind of went on the library's website and tried to find a bunch of different books that were available and might be interesting because I was just wanting to wanting to just do a lot of reading. <laughs> so um, let's start with this one, Kazuo Ishiguro, My 20th Century Evening and Other Small Breakthroughs. So that book was really just um, the publication of Ishiguro's Nobel Prize address. And he gave this speech, I think it was 2017 was when he won the prize. So it's about his past as a writer. Um, I, you know, maybe I should give more context here. Kazuo Ishiguro is a British Japanese author. He's most famous for The Remains of the Day, which is a fantastic book and film. The Remains of the Day. Uh, I really actually just really love the movie um, starring Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. Um, but either way, Ishiguro, uh, he's most known for that book, for books about nostalgia. Nostalgia is the, I'd say, the number one um, subject in his literary, in his, in the message he's trying to give, right? So I really love his writing style. It's probably, it's definitely my favorite of any author I've read. It's so gentle and unassuming, but it's very powerful. Uh, he can write horror, he can write romance, he can write suspense. And of course, the theme of nostalgia just runs throughout all of his wor works. Um, not all of his books are favorites of mine. Uh, let me see here. So I could just give you a quick rundown. Uh, Remains of the Day, I already mentioned that. Read it in college for a class and thought it was great. Uh, Never Let Me Go, I tried to read that one. And I do think I will try to read it again. Someone told me that it was worth finishing. So the, the beginning is a little slow, but I'm going to try it again. The Buried Giant. Um, so I really anticipated this book. Can I make these covers any bigger? This is kind of... There we go. That's uh, better, sort of. Mildly better. Okay, so The Buried Giant. This book is very much a departure from his other books. It's a fantasy story, sort of. It does have some of those nostalgic themes about this elderly couple, and they're taking this journey through this fantasy land. Um, I think I read, like, I want to say I read half of it, and I just couldn't connect with it. It was just not interesting to me. I didn't really like the way he used religious imagery in it either um, in sort of this very dark, twisted way. So that was a very different book from his others and I don't know. Uh, I think not a lot of people liked it to be honest. An Artist of the Floating World is one of my top favorites of his. It's about a guy, a Japanese guy who was a propaganda artist during World War II but the book takes place after the war, and he is reminiscing on the decisions he made as a younger man, as an artist. Superb book. So this is just sort of his best writing in terms of how he takes a subject matter that's very, very sensitive. Um, and he doesn't go overboard with the story. It's just really like listening to an older person talk. And uh, the story just comes out very organically. So I really enjoyed that one. A Pale View of Hills is another favorite, possibly. Um, I don't know if I'd call it my top favorite. It's a very chilling story. It's a ghost story. Um, similar setting and theme to An Artist of the Floating World. Um, yeah, I don't want to give too much away for that one. I just 
really thought A Pale View of Hills was superbly written and yes, very disturbing and chilling. So just a heads up if you do decide to read it. Uh, when We Were Orphans was actually the biggest miss for me out of all of his books. I did read it. It's about a young man who, um, I believe, oh, I'm trying to remember the story. Uh, I have a book review of it. Let me just go search for that real quick. Mostly my thoughts on this book was that, yeah, a study in meh. Um, it had such a great beginning. It's about a guy who goes back to China and tries to understand what happened to his mother. Uh, this is 1930s. And this book was just not well developed in terms of plot, in terms of characters, and I just can't recommend it. So that was unfortunate. The Unconsoled I'm planning to read hopefully in the next year because I'd like to really get through at least all of his books I haven't read yet because, whoops, uh-oh, because, because, um, Clara and the Sun is coming out next year, and this one really intrigues me. It's about, well, that was helpful. Um, it's about, oh dear, okay, um, you know, oh, I see what's going on here. Let's just go read the summary on Amazon. Clara and the Sun, the first novel by Ishiguro since he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature, tells the story of Clara, an artificial friend with outstanding observational qualities, who, from her place in the store, watches carefully the behavior of those who come in to browse, and of those who pass on the street outside. She remains hopeful that a customer will soon choose her. So obviously the artificial intelligence side of it is very interesting. I like that he's kind of going into, again, fairy tale realm here, but who knows how he's going to take it, right? So, um, yeah, I'm really hoping that's a good one. Uh, Nocturnes is a bunch of short stories kind of with a musical theme because he used to be a, I want to say, a member of a rock band. Like, he, he did music in his youth before he went into writing, so... Nocturnes, mm, most of it wasn't really my thing, just because, I, I don't know, I uh, thought most of the stories were pretty boring. Also have a review on the blog. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a whirlwind tour of Kazuo Ishiguro, and just sort of an explanation of why I wanted to read this, um, this Nobel lecture, if you will. Alright, that's a lot of um, background story on that, so key thoughts from that book. Um, so he was giving some tips about writing and number one thing that I noticed was he said a lot of people try to spend time building up three-dimensional characters and that's that's great, right? You do want to do that. The second thing that you want to do as a writer is create three-dimensional character relationships. And this is something that we talked about before and uh, pertaining to, I can't remember which book it was, but the idea that you have these minor conflicts between characters, even characters on the same side, and that really distinguishes sort of a um, cardboard cutout book from a, a greater piece of literature, especially one that's character driven. So trying to think about how you can make those relationships between your characters more nuanced, um, give them some little minor conflicts, and uh, he does this, again, brilliantly in The Remains of the Day, because the big conflict in The Remains of the Day is really twofold. It's the narrator and his own conscience and his own uh, life philosophy, but also the narrator and his romantic interest, but it's not just... Um, kind of a, like, it's not just merely, um, enemies to lovers or something like that, you know, it's, it's, um, there's, like, a much deeper conflict there, which pertains to their personal philosophies and just, you know, the way they live their lives. So, very cool to have him kind of highlight that in this, uh, this book.
Okay, I had to make that a little bigger. I should have done that earlier. Um, I have to remember people are looking at this on their phones sometimes. Um, all right, what else did he say in this book? Some great quotes. Let me just get out my iPad and I will read you some of the quotes. Oh, wait. Yeah. Um, I was trying to remember if I still had them on here, but I'm pretty sure I do. <laughs> All right, so let me see here. Okay, so I think I've got them here, and uh, let me let me just make this other screen bigger. Okay, so some great quotes from uh, Ishiguro about writing, but not just about writing, but about the specific topics he writes about. So, what exactly are the memories of a nation? Where are they kept? How are they shaped and controlled? Are there times when forgetting is the only way to stop cycles of violence or to stop a society disintegrating into chaos or war? On the other hand, can stable free nations really be built on foundations of willful amnesia and frustrated justice? I heard myself telling the questioner that I wanted to find a way to write about these things, but that for the moment, unfortunately, I couldn't think how I'd do it. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and so here's the same, uh, same thing, or same train of thought. It seemed to me a powerful metaphor for a larger dilemma. How were such memories to be preserved? Would the glass domes transform these relics of evil and suffering into tame museum exhibits? What should we choose to remember? When is it better to forget and move on? In uh, context here, he was visiting a concentration camp that had been, you know, preserved. Um, Back on the subject of writing, uh, all good stories, never mind how radical or traditional in their mode of telling, had to contain relationships that are important to us, that move us, amuse us, anger us, surprise us. And then, let's see. Um, Stories can entertain, sometimes teach, or argue a point, but for me, the essential thing is that they communicate feelings, that they appeal to what we share as human beings across our borders and divides. There are large, glamorous industries around stories, the book industry, the movie industry, the television industry, the theater industry. But in the end, stories are about one person saying to another, this is the way it feels to me. Can you understand what I'm saying? Does it also feel this way to you? And then let's see, this is, this part was actually really interesting. He says, well, he's talking about, um, oh, let's see here. He's talking about trying to find his place in the literate, literary scene of the 1980s in England. And back then, as he points out, there wasn't really this sense of, I guess, international literature um except for um Salman Rushdie and V.S. Naipaul so they were starting down that direction but it was it was still very new so he said I wanted like them to write international fiction that could easily cross cultural and linguistic boundaries even while writing a story set in what seemed to be a peculiarly English world and that's one thing I also really love about his writing style is it's so accessible. You don't have to be uh, a literary reading genius to understand what he's saying. Um, his complexity is all in the 
structure of the story itself, not in the words, but in how he's set things up, the little phrases people say to each other, and um, just, yeah, that those kind of, like, those kind of structural details that just, I think, set him apart from other writers. All right, so that was Ishiguro's 20th Century Evening. Um, going back to the other books I've read, again, repeats from the blog, but maybe even after waiting a little while, I'll have some more ideas on these. So, um, Bilbo's last song is a little poem by T Tolkien about um, Bilbo leaving Middle-earth, illustrated by Pauline Baines, who illustrated the Chronicles of Narnia. I didn't really care for this book that much. It was very short. There wasn't really much to it, but the illustrations are very nice. I think I would have preferred just to see the illustrations. Um, I don't know. Uh, if you if you can get this from the library, then it's probably worth checking out, but it was just not what I was expecting necessarily. Um, they Called Us Enemy is a graphic novel by George Takei, and fantastic book. This is about his experiences in internment camps, um, which FDR ordered during World War II in America. Um, Japanese citizens, or Japanese American citizens, I should say, um, were just treated terribly. And he goes through that experience through the eyes of a child, which with the graphic illustrations is very, um, very moving and I learned a lot that I didn't know about that time. Um, yeah, one of the sad local facts, uh, local history facts, is the Washington State Fairgrounds was somewhere that the Japanese were held temporarily before being moved to other um, camps. And so, like, these, um, these historical places and relics, I guess, are, are still around, and there's, there may even be, there's likely people that still remember these experiences. And certainly Takei, he, um, he has some TED Talks on YouTube, which kind of goes over the same, uh, content, I believe, as this book. So, you can check that out, you can check out the book, but definitely look into it, and, um, yeah, just, it's, it's very sobering. Um, Let's see, I also, I, I was reading The Alchemist, I started reading The Alchemist, and have definitely struggled reading it. I want to finish it. It's a very simple book, so it's not as if it's difficult. Um, I think that, it, see, the, the big theme about it is this idea of your life's destiny and finding your destiny, and well, that's, a, that's a concept I've really struggled with recently, so I just think it's surprisingly difficult for me to read, but I will um, try to finish that by the end of the year and give a proper review of it. Um, the Setting Sun by Asumu, Asamu Dazai. I'm not sure if I said that right. So this is a work of Japanese literature. I actually did a kind of a book review of it, but essentially it's about a family after World War II in Japan and how their uh, former lives as aristocrats have changed and they're trying to um, basically create a new life for themselves, but it's not going very well. They're just feeling very, very much overcome by despair. And so that's, that's basically the book. Um... Let's see here. Okay, um, I'm gonna talk about Strindberg or Strin Strinby um, real quick. So let me switch back to my other screen. Um, Miss Julie and other plays. I've been reading this as part of a read along. It's interesting. Uh, this, these are plays written in the late 1800s, early 1900s by a Swedish author and playwright named Johan August Strindberg. And 
he was a, a very negative character. If you read his own writings, um, you'll notice there's like a strong theme of misogyny in here. And I'm not just like saying that lightly. Um, Okay, here's a, here's a lovely quote from him. Uh, Woman, the stunted form of human being who stands between man, the lord of creation. Wait, let me start at the beginning here. Victim of a superstition. No, I'll, I'll start at the beginning of the paragraph because otherwise it won't make sense. Miss Julie is a modern character, which does not mean that the man-hating half-woman has not existed in every age, just that she has now been discovered, has come out into the open and made herself heard. Victim of a superstition one that has seized even stronger minds, that woman, the stunted form of human being who stands between man, the lord of creation, the creator of culture, and the child, is meant to be the equal of man or could ever be. She involves herself in an absurd struggle in which she falls. So that's the kind of uh, misogyny we're talking about. And unfortunately, it really is prevalent throughout his books, or throughout these plays, let me say. I have read the first three plays, The Father, Miss Julie, The Dance of Death. And yeah, that kind of thinking is prevalent in the plays, which is very sad. Um, he certainly, I mean, I would say he definitely makes this very emotional, like the characters have these really impassioned speeches and discussions. Um, it's not very pleasant, but I think he was really pouring some of his own experiences in here. But incidentally, the male characters are also extremely unpleasant. So yeah, that's uh, my first impressions of this guy. Let me switch over to a more interesting or more um, enjoyable book, which is this one called Is That Kafka? Uh, 99 Finds by Reiner Stock. And this is a book also from the library. And it's really, this guy went and wrote a massive biography on Kafka. And so what he did in this book was he decided to take some of the greatest hits, I guess, from his findings and um, take some of the greatest hits from his massive biography and distill them down into a sort of greatest hits or 99 greatest hits. I'm really enjoying this book, okay? It's, if you're a Kafka fan, uh, Kafka, the author of The Metamorphosis, The Trial, The Castle, America. Um, I really like this book. Let's see here. It's just got so many interesting and random things. So, for example... Um, sorry, that's the preface... So it talks about things like, okay, Kafka really was did not like telling lies, and so it'll talk about an exception when he told a lie. Um, it'll talk about his favorite song, which he sang in the sanatorium when he was there. Um, let me go back to the actual table of contents, because that'll give you a better idea of what it talks about. So um, Kafka cheats on his exams. Uh, Kafka's exercise routine, uh, Kafka's only enemy, what color were Kafka's eyes? I really liked that one. Um, and true enough, since he's kind of this legendary figure, there's about three or four different shades of color that people call his eyes. Um, officially, his eyes were dark blue-gray, so yeah, <laughs> that's not ambiguous at all. Um, yeah, it's a fun book. I recommend it if you're a Kafka fan. I'm only up through 
Uh, number 19. And it's not in any particular order that I can see. So we'll see. I would have expected it to be in a chronological order, but I'm not really sure that it is. There were some scenes from his childhood earlier on. But yeah, I'm not, I don't, I don't know that this is chronological order, so. Um... All right. Now, uh, I've kind of gone through all of those books that I've read recently, book I'm reading currently. Uh, so the rest of the year, trying to figure out what I'm going to do, because we've only got a month and a half, and, you know, I think I'm doing okay with my Goodreads challenge. I think I decided to read like 45 books or something like that and I'm kind of in the upper 30s at this point. So I think it's doable that I'll finish. wanted to share something really cool that I found yesterday. So if you guys, if any of you follow the Classics Club, it's basically an online community of readers, um, which you can find via this blog, theclassicsclub.wordpress.com. What you do basically is you create a list of books you want to read over a period of four years, four or five years. Let me show you my list actually real quick. So I created this February 2019. I'm not really doing that well. <laughs> uh... Not that I'm reading, not that I'm not reading classics, but I have been reading a lot more nonfiction recently. So this is my list of books I want to read before February 2024. Still have plenty of time. And if any of you guys do the classics club list, let me know. Have you ever finished it? Because we're talking 50, 50 books here. Uh... Yeah, so really out of the gate trying to get through Tolstoy. I've never read anything by him. Finishing up the Bronte sisters with The Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Scarlet Letter, Outstanding, Unread. Uh, True Grit, really want to read that. The Red and the Black, I might actually swap this one out because I tried reading it and it, something I just lost interest somehow. Even though the beginning was strong. Um... I know some of these I have read, but I'm not, I'm really not making a very big dent here for something I need to finish in a few years. Um, Testament of Youth. Yeah, some of the bloggers I follow absolutely loved that book. I have it, so it's a good reason to read it. Uh, Wendell Berry. A lot of people have been asking me to read him. Um, The Death of Arthur. Some kind of, I don't know, I don't know if niche is the word, but like, um, less, lesser known classics, I guess. Although, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then at the bottom I just put in a bunch of books to reread. Because I'm always like trying to reread books and I, I never seem to get around to it because I'm just too interested in reading new books. Um, but anyway, going back to the Classics Club, they put out a list of nonfiction classics, which I think is fantastic. Uh, I actually contributed to this on the original blog post where we were able to comment what we thought were good nonfiction classics. And so I would recommend checking this out. I can post a link in the chat. Um... Also, hi everyone who's watching. Uh, it tells me I have like seven people watching, but one of those might be me. So, hello. Thanks for joining. Um, this is more of a monologue than an interactive live stream. But uh, yeah, I want to share this because it's a really good list. It's... Wait, where did it go? Oh, sorry. I, I posted the wrong one think. Hold up, hold up. Okay, here's the correct list. I'll put that in the chat too. 
Um, all right, so... Right, that's correct. Okay, so... Yeah, what I liked about this list is because it's, you know, crowdsourced, a lot of these are just pe things people commented. It's pretty diverse. I mean, it's not just Western literature. There's also, I think, some Chinese literature on here. Um, there's different time periods. There's uh, memoirs. There's also books that are um, like you know, wisdom literature. And some I've never heard of. Letters from an American farmer. I have heard of I heard of this one. Uh, a pilgrim at Tinker's Creek. I've never heard of that, but it sounds like it would be really interesting. So yeah, it's a neat list. My contribution was, of course, I had to put in a put in one for Lawrence here. Seven Pillars of Wisdom, one of the greatest books I've read, nonfiction wise. Um, but I also really thought that. Uh, Man's Search for Meaning was worth reading too. And also, also um, Diary of Anne Frank. You know, so, yeah. If you're looking for some nonfiction to read, this is a super great place to start. The other thing I want to uh, share with y'all is, and I've mentioned these people before, but the Public Domain Review. This blog has all kinds of interesting public domain content, and it's kind of a kind of a magazine because the articles are very well written, very high quality, lots of great pictures, everything related to public domain content, and you can actually uh, you can actually write for this. So if you have things you want to submit, I think they can take they take submissions. I've thought about it. I just haven't haven't um, got around to it yet. So for example, latest article here: uh, ideas of extraterrestrial life. So this guy really uh, put a lot of thought into it. Ooh, that's cool. <laughs> Okay, so, hmm, an interesting use of giant pumpkins. Yeah, so you'll find the weirdest, randomest, funnest stuff on this website. Um, granted, all this stuff's really old, so some of it may or may not be offensive. Um, but this article I absolutely loved. This is, um, I am my own her heroine. How Mary, how Marie Boschkritzeff. I don't know if I said that right. Bosch Kurtzoff rewrote the route to fame. And this is a really interesting story. Now, this book has been on my list to read a long time. I have not yet read it, but it's basically a memoir by this young Russian girl who wanted to be famous, right? So imagine, you know, somebody on YouTube, for example, trying to make it big. Well, this was, this girl wanted to do the same thing with her memoir. I'm not going to give anything away because I really recommend this article, but it's a tragic story. It's absolutely fascinating in terms of how it portrays human psychology, not just her own psychology, but mass media. So yeah, very, very tragic story, but I just, I thought it was so good. And it makes me want to read her memoir even more. So check that out. And oh, it's a fun, fun blog to follow. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about for websites for now. Um, so what am I going to be reading the rest of the year? I have a few books that I've just sort of found on the library that I might read, but I really want to try to finish this biography of Nikola Tesla this year. <laughs> um, we'll see. This book is one that I started off very strong with. It, 
it was just very interesting to me. It still is. And I love the use of old illustrations throughout this book. Illustrations from Tesla's own time. It just takes you back. It's very cool. And of course the typography is really cool too. This is uh, Princeton and they just have... I actually follow them on Instagram. They have really great graphic design for their books. So, I mean, that's always interesting to me, but yeah, I kind of lost momentum earlier in the book, about a third through the book, which is too bad because I think once I get to, I think once I get to the later chapters, I think it's going to go really fast because then you're getting into his more futuristic work. Um, such as wireless electricity and you know, those kind of things. Um, yeah, and I'm no scientist, so I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I, I can find most of this understandable. Some of it is a little too technical for me. Uh, but I, I get the gist of it. So it's not completely unreadable to just everyday people like myself. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try to finish that. Someone just mentioned to me uh, this biography, which I had talked about previously. Another one that I have not finished. <laughs> so I have a reason, though. Like, I didn't really like the beginning of this biography. I don't know what it is, but both this one and the Ernest Shackleton biography I have, the author just makes weird sort of excuses for bad behavior um and that just like kind of turns me off so i'm gonna keep reading it because i want to learn the new information about lawrence that this guy supposedly has uncovered so that might be good um another one maybe i'll read at the same time is to begin the world over again lawrence of arabia from damascus to baghdad another book i've had in my possession for a long time I have also already read several lengthy biographies about Arabia, or about Lawrence, I mean. I don't expect to learn anything new here, but this will be a good refresher because I think it attempts to give a biography of Lawrence, but also a historical overview. And I'm really intrigued by the length of this book. It's about half the length of any other book I've read on Lawrence, so if it's good, at conveying the same information in a succinct way, uh, that'll be great. It'll be interesting to to find that out. So yeah, um, what else? I think that was about it I had for this live stream. It was kind of a on, on the shorter side. Um, upcoming videos, I could talk about that. Let me see if I can find my notes. So yeah, I might do a video on movies that I've found interesting, uh, or best movies that I've watched in 2020. That might be a live stream, that might be a video. Um, I know that's not really book related, but that's um, that's kind of the main idea I have. I actually have figured out how to get my Windows computer working so i'm thinking about doing a play of this game so i've got this really old computer game please don't laugh um sherlock holmes nemesis it's literally the only computer game i own anymore so I'm thinking about doing a let's play of Sherlock Holmes Nemesis, but it'll be kind of just world exploring because the first scene of it is, I'm pretty sure it's just him wandering around the art gallery in in London. So it's just kind of a fun, semi-relaxing game. Um, 
might do that. If I can figure out the technology as far as playing the game, allowing you to hear the audio and my voice, if I can somehow figure that out, this might be fun to, to do sometime. Um, I really, yeah, I'm sure everyone will laugh at the graphics because this is super, super old. It's like 10 years old, so we can, we can laugh. It's, it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's all I had. Thanks for hanging out. Any last thoughts in the chat? Yeah, I just really do find this an interesting website. I thought that I was pretty well familiar with all the public domain content, but they find some very, very surprising things. Um, let's see. The other thing that might be fun at some point this Classics Club often has, they have a monthly uh, meme, they call it, basically a questionnaire. So like the past one they did was discuss the classics you read as a child, who introduced you to them, which ones were your favorites, do you still reread them as an adult, why and why not? And then I think the previous month the question was... Think about some of your favorite classics. How do their stories, characters, or themes still resonate with you today? What can a modern re what can a modern day reader learn from these books written in very different times? This could be a positive or negative message given constantly changing social mores. If a classic book no longer meets the social standards of our day, how do we best engage with its story or its themes in our modern world? You know, um, I'll just that this guy is a really good example right oh i just realized i was not showing you anything what i was reading okay that's wonderful um yeah so classics club or yeah the classics club has these monthly questionnaires they're called the classic meme. So if you go on their blog, you'll you'll find it. It's really easy to find. Um, but yeah, stories that don't that, that no longer fall into our social norms of what's acceptable. I I mean I'm totally in favor of continuing to publish these books because um, I think I think that it, certainly in a book like this, there's probably someone out there that um, may relate to some of the feelings of this author and. I don't think it's a bad thing to publish these books, even though they're full of negativity, um, because the only way you can ever reach people is to allow them to be heard and also to um, understand where they're coming from. Maybe they have had some experiences or, you know, something that triggered them into feeling this way. That absolutely does not excuse that kind of negativity and, you know, certainly not any mistreatment of anyone. Uh, but again, if we can, you know, rather than completely turning those people away, which I think is absolutely detrimental to any kind of social progress, you know, trying to engage with them and talk with them. So one thing about this book is there's not a lot of logic in it, in his thinking, in his uh, the way he's presenting these scenarios. So, a, a lot of it's just pure rage, emotion, and you know, trying to get people to think a little more critically through literature, I think, is always a good thing. So, yeah, I think that I'm glad they're still publishing books like this, even though I'm not enjoying it, even though I wouldn't recommend it necessarily. Um, some comments in the chat here. Um, Greg says he wants to read The Remains of the Day. Yeah, I would really recommend that one. It's a good introduction to Ishiguro. Um, and most people would consider it his best. Uh, Vens Between the Lines says, hello, Marion. Hi. And 
Thanks for joining. We're kind of winding down here, but yeah, this was really fun. And I'm hoping to do more live streams in the future. Um, yeah, uh, so yeah, I'm going to probably wrap it up here. Uh, thanks for watching and please like the video if you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.